This reminds me of 361. Georgia. <laughs> they're, all in, they're all in Georgia, huh? It's kind of early. When's the student thing begin? Tomorrow? Student ASHE meeting starts tomorrow in Atlanta? So yeah. yeah, tomorrow. Okay. And, and to get to Atlanta by Saturday, you need to leave um, like 8 o'clock on Friday morning. Okay, that's cool. Um, all right. So here's what we're going to do. Let's, let's, let's th see where we are here. So ostensibly, you're supposed to receive a MATLAB homework today. I don't know if the TA has it ready, but it's not actually due for two weeks because we're, uh, you know, we're not going to be here next week. And so he's, I think, a little tired, as you might imagine. Um, but I'll get on his case and have him produce it early next week, and that'll still give you like 10 days. That's, that should be fine, right? Okay. Um, then you should be working on the projects that you've, you know, sent me so that you're not doing that at the last minute. That's due the last day of class. It should look just like the ones you submitted um, in 361, you know, I mean, f in terms of format. All right. Um, we have a final exam. That's cool. Um, well, maybe cool. So I think we have, if I'm not mistaken, we only have like three more lectures after this or four. So three of them are going to be lectures on new material, and the last one's going to be a review of the final exam from last year. Um, and so I didn't quite finish this lecture, and I'm not even going to bother starting the next lecture because it's kind of hopeless, right? I'll get to the first five slides, and then 10 days later we'll come back, and it'll be like, what? So I probably have to cut the last lecture out that's posted, but that, that's okay. So, you know, maybe we'll get out of here early. I'm kind of, my other motivation is I forgot to bring any snack this morning. So I'm like really hungry and looking forward to getting downstairs as soon as possible to get um, something to eat. I'm kidding. That's not my major motivation, but it is true. All right. Okay, so um, we're talking about a city of cascade control. So just so you remember the kind of thing we're talking about, this is an example of traditional feedback control. And it's, so there's nothing that um, new about this, right? So we have an oil stream. We want to heat this up in a furnace because we want to use this hot oil for something. So, you know, typically we think about controlling the temperature here by measuring it and then sending a signal to this valve and this valve will control the amount of natural gas going into the furnace so we can control the temperature of the oil coming out. And this would seem like a pretty sensible strategy based on things we've talked about. The problem with this is if this upstream pressure changes, which it would tend to do, um, then you're going to get some variations in flow here even though the valve position might remain constant. And if you get a variation in flow, eventually that'll manifest itself in a variation in temperature. So a better way to think about doing it is like this to do a cascade control. So instead of the temperature controller manipulating this valve directly, it manipulates the set point for this pressure controller, which is basically a flow controller for gas. And so the job of this controller is one and one thing only. It's simply to control the downstream pressure of this valve. So that way, if you get upstream pressure variations, this will automatically adjust to keep this valve, this pressure the same, and that'll tend to create a more um, stable flow going in, and that'll tend to give you a temperature coming out that's more stable with less variation, okay? And again, we talked about cascade control being useful because if we envision um, the disturbance here, which is the pressure of this gas here, that's going to be measured and indicated much more quickly by measurement of pressure right here than it will be temperature way over here. So that's the advantage of cascade control. that We can see the disturbance much more quickly in this new measurement that we add. Okay? And we went through some other examples, obviously. Um, and then we got to this point, right? And so this is our block general block diagram for a cascade control system. So in this case, we have two disturbances, one that enters the outer loop, which this cascade controller is not supposed to help with, and then this um, disturbance that enters the inner loop. So this inner loop requires you have an additional measurement. In the case that I showed you, it was the downstream pressure of the valve. And then you have an additional controller. So two controllers, two measurements. This controller here, the inner controller right here, this inner loop, its job is simply to establish whatever set point this controller tells it to, to achieve. Okay? So this might be temperature control of a reactor, and then this is the set point for a you know, controller for a coolant flow into the reactor or something like that. So based on this block diagram, um, we determined the closed loop transfer function. We went through this last time, and we, for example, determined the closed loop transfer function between that disturbance that enters the inner loop and the output of interest that we want to control, actually, is this, is this mess here. 
you know, it's pretty complicated. It involves the both controller transfer functions, GC1, which is the outer controller, and GC2, which is the inner controller, in some kind of complex way. All right, so we did some analysis, which I don't want to go through again, um, to convince you that cascade control is good. Um, and now what I wanted to do is show you actually how to design these controllers. Okay? So conceptually, we talked about doing the design like this. So the first thing you would do, and, and by the way, when you guys do lab, Okay, I'm not, okay, I am going to make this joke. If you ever do lab again, you're going to see this a lot in the second semester because the first semester you don't do much control with the idea that you haven't had the control class. But if you take 402, some of you will take the biochem um, lab, I know. But if you take 402, they'll, you know, half the experiments maybe or third will involve control. And you'll see this cascade control a lot. Okay, and I think students are already working on some of the systems like the pH system. They're already working with cascade control. They just don't know it. Okay, they, they know it now, but they didn't know it um, yesterday. All right, so here's the idea. So if you would want to tune a cascade controller, okay, so let's say this is like a level to flow cascade, right? The job here is to control level in a tank, right? And you're going to control level in a tank, let's say, by manipulating the flow going out of the tank. So the job of this controller is just to establish whatever outlet flow this controller tells it to do, okay? So implicit in all this is that this inner loop here has to be fast compared to this outer loop. Otherwise, this doesn't work well, right? So the idea is if this controller says, please change the flow going out of the tank, this can do it really quickly. Okay, otherwise this whole idea breaks down. So this has to be much faster time scale than this one. Okay, so if we want to design the controller, we have two controllers to design. The first thing we're going to do is turn this controller off, put it in auto manual, okay? So you understand, when we turn this controller off, it means now we have access to this set point. We can change it ourselves. So we um, would tune this controller here so it responds well to set point changes that we impose here ourselves. Okay, so you could use PI or PID. Obviously, you have a model of this process, which I'm about to show you. You can do any of the designs we talked about to design this. So you design this loop to be PI or PID or something like that using any of the methods we talked about. Make it so it's fast, right? And then... At that point, you leave this controller on, leave it alone, and then you proceed to, to build this controller. Okay? The design of this controller depends intimately on this inner loop. Okay? So that's why you have to design this one first, design it to be fast, and then you design this one. Okay? All right. So first of all, you would design the flow controller, and then once you have good flow control, then you would design the level controller. All right. And you should appreciate that flow control the process for a flow controller, that's a valve. The process for a level controller is a tank. So you can make the flow controller a lot faster than the level controller. All right? And if you decide for whatever reason you don't like this controller's tuning or design and you want to redo it, then you're going to have to redo this one um, because this design depends on that one. Because from the standpoint of this controller, the process is this whole thing over here and includes this controller. Okay? All right. So this is where we got intimidated last time and abandoned ship. And so now we're going to do this, and um, so let me see if I can, um, there's a lot of equations here, cl clearly. I've, I've outdone even myself on this slide. Um, so let me see, t tell you what I'm trying to do, okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a direct synthesis kind of approach. You remember the idea of direct synthesis is you decide what you'd like the response to be, and then you design the controller to get it, okay? Now, so I can avoid slipping back and forth between slides, you may recall on a previous slide, we derived this transfer function. We called it actually G1, I believe. This is the transfer function between the set point that enters that inner loop and the output of that inner loop. Okay? We obtain this transfer function. It's from a previous slide. I have to do this. I know you're going to hate me, but I'm used to that. All right. So we're talking about this transfer function here between this point and this point. Okay, we derive that closed loop transfer function. Well, so let me say conceptually what we're going to do here. We're going to specify what we'd like that closed loop transfer function to be between Y2 and its set point. We're going to design this controller to achieve that. Once we've done that, okay, then we're going to specify what we'd like the, the response to be between Y1 and its set point, and we're going to design this controller to give us that. Okay, so it's just like direct synthesis squared, if you want to think of it that way. All right, and this is not in the book, by the way. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, what you should have figured out from the class in 361, if it's in the notes, I think it's important. If it's not in the notes, then you don't need to worry about it. The book has a lot more material. Sometimes I have material in the notes that's not in the book, and this is an example of that. Okay, 
So here's that closed loop transfer function, okay? Right? Just taken from the notes. What I'm going to do is I want this to equal GD2. What's a GD2? Well, you know, it'd be a typical thing. It would look something like this. All right, first order, gain of one, adjustable time constant, which I call tau C2, instead of tau C, since I'm going to have two of them. Okay, so I, I would choose something like that, and I would tell you what the tau C2 would be. It needs to be small, okay, compared to tau C1 for the other controller, which I'll talk about. Okay, so that's what that would look like. So obviously, now that I've set this equal to this, um, I solved this equation for the controller transfer function, right? That's the design procedure here. And so if you take this, you have GC2 there and there, but it's just algebraic, right? You do the algebra, you'll get, you'll get this solution. Just solve that for GC2. All right? Um, and then to try to make this um, analogous to what you've seen in the past, I said, let's just assume that GM1 is 1, or you could also say, let's just, um, well, let's just say that, okay? GM1 is 1. So it has, this measurement device has no appreciable dynamics and has a gain of one, then that thing will become one and that, this expression will become this, okay. The reason I'm doing that is because you might remember when we did direct synthesis in the past for regular conventional feedback, it looked um, like this. Right, this was the design equation we came up with when we talked about direct synthesis. So it's the controller transfer functions one over the process transfer function, then you have this expression involving the desired transfer function, GD. And so, if you look at this expression, right, now we have GD2 replacing GD, and, and we have this thing replacing what I call GP over in that equation. So that's why I say this, this is like the process, this is the G, the process transfer function effectively when we design this controller. You understand? I'm just making an analogy between that equation and the equation over there and saying, ah, oh, that's, pr that's the normal process transfer function if we do conventional control. So we can think of this as being the, the inner process transfer function when we do this design. Just to draw an analogy to say the equation looks the same. Okay? All right. So that's cool. So obviously to use this equation or this one, you would need to know the GD2, you'd need to know these other transfer functions, you know, you'd plug them in, you'd see maybe if it's a PI controller, same stuff we've done before. Okay, so there's the design of the GC2, okay. Now the GC2 is, is, is um, fixed, and here is the transfer function that we obtained, again, from a previous slide, between the set point and the output. So this is the output we actually want to control and it's at set point. This is the outer loop, right? We got this transfer function. It involved, um, did we actually get that one? Hold on a second. Might have lied a little bit to you here. I guess I didn't actually, <laughs> so that's actually new. We draw, you understand there's three transfer functions you could get for Y1. You could get the one respect to D2, which we did that for obvious reasons. You get the one respect to D1, and you could also get the one respect to the set point. We didn't actually do the set point, but the methodology is exactly the same as I showed you here. And so, without further ado, you can see it looks like this. Okay, so it involves the G1 here. How did I get this? You remember the block diagram yesterday? I wrote on the board after much, it took me a big effort to write this block diagram after I eliminated the inner loop. From that block diagram, you can easily derive this expression, okay? All right, so you have this expression. It involves, you know, various transfer functions, including the controller transfer function you want to design, and also the G1, okay? And so, so I've gone from here to here, okay? So what have I done here? What I've done is replaced, I've, I've made the uh, realization that G1 is equal to GD2. So this is a little confusing maybe, but in the past, when we've derived this on the previous slide, I defined this thing to, because I got tired of dealing with it, I just defined this to be G1, right? If you go back in the notes, you'll see I defined this exact thing to be G1. That's just a definition. Now what I've done is designed this controller such that this thing equals GD2. So, right? 
So it's by definition it's called G1 and now I've designed this controller so it's equal to GD2. So G1 is, and GD2 are the same thing. They're both equal to that. Okay. Um, so that's what I've done. I've made the replacement of G1 right here and here equal to GD2 and GD2 there. Okay. It just may, you, could, you could plug the G1 in here and do all the algebra and stuff. It just gets a lot more complicated. Okay. All right. So I have this transfer function now. So I made this realization that these G1 and GD2 are the same. And now I specify what I'd like this thing to be. Okay. Um, and so GD1 most likely would look just like this. It would be first order. It would have some time constant. Right. It would have a gain of one. And I should be designing these controllers so that time, right, the closed loop time constant for the inner loop is a lot less than the closed loop time constant for the outer loop. Because we need the inner loop to be fast compared to the outer loop. So it's typical rule of thumb is you'd like the inner loop to be like five or ten times faster than the outer loop. So, you know, if this, if this number was ten, you might want the inner loop to be one or something like this. Okay? If you don't design it this way, okay, this isn't going to work well. All right, so that's what GD1 would look like. Guess what? Now we have an equation. You can solve that equation for the GC1 here. It appears there and there. So if you solve this algebra equation for GC1, you get this. Okay? And again, to make the analogy, to, make it, to show you it looks like what we used to get, um, if you make the assumption that this GM1 is just a gain and is equal to KM1, then you can, um, what, you can put KM1 right there and then you can factor the KM1 out and then it looks like this. So it looks just like the equation over there or just like the equation here for that matter. It's got the GD1 with this form and then it's got one over something and so I call this the outer process, right? Because typically it's one over the process transfer function. So for the outer loop, this is the process transfer function essentially. And you can see it involves the design of the inner loop, right? So if you change GD2, which means that you change the design of GC2, you'll change the design of GC1, right? Design, design them sequentially. All right, so let's say you wanted to use these formulas. Um, I'll just do it for you. <laughs> I was going to say, here's how you do it, but I just do it. You might recall last time um, I did the following. I went through this little example here, and then I said, I'll show you later how I got it. Right? And so to do this example, which I'll show you again in a minute, I, I applied these formulas for a particular example, and this is the example. So I'm just making these formula, I'm just making these transfer functions up. So there's the valve, there's the um, outer process transfer function, the inner process transfer function just one, which means we have a flow controller because we're trying to control, right? If, the, if you go back and look at this, anytime I say GP2 equals one, it means the inner loop, the process, just a valve. So that means it's just a flow controller. Okay. Otherwise, it could be something more. Okay. Like for example, when I when we did the jacketed reactor, this would be a model of the jacket, right? So the valve controls jacket temperature, and this would be the actual reactor. So it can be more. But if I just tell you GP2 is one, I'm telling you essentially all I want to do is the inner loop's a flow controller, and I'm controlling the valve. All right. So there's the valve transfer function. There's the process transfer function. Hopefully the valve is a lot faster than the process. <laughs> Otherwise, you're, you have a terrible valve or a really fast process. It's 10 times faster, so that looks pretty good. And the other, I wanted to make life really easy, right? So I made every other transfer function of interest equal to 1. So that's the inner process. Oh, this is terrible notation. Um, <laughs> let me, what am I doing here? <laughs> I'm stunned by my own inadequacies. Okay, um, I'll come back to this. Just pretend like you didn't see these two things right here right now. We're going to come back to this. All right. Valve, inner process, sorry, outer process, inner process, both the measurement devices are just assumed to be gains. Okay. Now, you see, this is, the, this is a notational problem. You've probably seen this kind of thing in the past. So, you know, unfortunately, we have two sets of GD1s and GD2s. Sorry about this, right? 1 GD1 and GD2 corresponds to those things. Th sorry. Um, these represent the dynamics of the process. Got nothing to do with m engineering a controller, right? It's just how the disturbances affect the output. So, right? Since we have two of them, we call this GD1 and GD2. Unfortunately, we decided that we'd also call the desired behavior of this inner loop GD1 and the desired behavior of this outer loop GD1. 
So they're the same. <laughs> no one else is laughing. OK, whatever. Um, they're the same notation, but they don't mean the same thing. Because you see down here, I say GD1 is, now I say GD2 is this. Okay. So I apologize for this. It's just when you get so many transfer functions after a while and they all have to be called G, you run out of subscripts, apparently. All right. So, so I don't know that we actually need these things, to be honest with you, in any of the designs. But you might want to make a note that this corresponds to the disturbance transfer functions. That's why it's D. And this requires the desired closed loop transfer functions. That's why those D. They're two different things. Sorry. All right. So this is how I'm going to design the inner loop. Okay, I'm going to design the inner loop, this thing here, to look just like that. And I'm going to take the desired closed-loop transfer function to be 0.2. That's actually quite a bit faster. That's five times faster than the, than the dynamics of the open loop, right? Because normally what we say is we take the closed-loop time constant <laughs> to be some, some fraction of the open loop time constant. For the inner loop, the open loop, for the inner loop, the process is just the valve because of that. And that time constant is 1, but I've taken it to be 5 times faster. I want the inner loop to be really fast. Okay? It's pretty fast, but it should be, should be okay. All right? So now that I have that thing, I plug in the equation I gave you on the previous page. I won't go back to it. It's just rewritten here. Okay? So I plug in all these transfer functions here. So what? GP2 is just that thing. GV is that thing. The GD2 is this thing. You plug it all in, and you end up with something that looks like this. Okay, it's not hard to see, right? GP2 is 1, you get 1 over GV, so you get that. And then if you reduce this thing, it ends up looking like that. Okay, just you could trust me on this one. Not sure after this you would trust me, but you should anyway. All right, so we look at this and we immediately say, ah, oh, that's a PI controller, right? Because the numerator is first order in S, and the, sec and the denominator is first order in S, but there's no constant, so you know you can rearrange that to be PI. Um, What's the other one? Is the other one also PI? So, right, we know that a, we've played this game before, but we know that a PI controller looks like this. This is how we normally write it. But for doing these kind of comparisons, it's, it's more convenient to write it like this. Okay, so if something's a PI controller if it has this form. First order and S in the numerator, first order S in the denominator, but there can't be a constant over here. Okay. All right. So you can see right from here, yep, that's what it looks like, all right. And then I've done a little simplification, not a lot, right? I multiplied five times one fifth and got one. Not a great achievement. And then I said, okay, this is a PI controller. So for this PI controller, you can see the gain is equal to one and the tau i is equal to one. Right? To go from there to there. Okay. So PI controller, great. Okay. So now I'm going to design the outer controller using the formulas I have on the previous page. I'm going to use this as des desired closed loop transfer function. Right? So I picked five here for the tau, what I call tau C1 in this equation. And that is a reasonable number. It's one half this number, right? So this is the dynamics of the outer loop. Time constant of 10, so I've taken the desired closed loop transfer function of a closed loop time constant of half of that, 5. Okay? And you can see I definitely have satisfied this. I wanted tau C2 to be a lot less than tau C1, and I can tell you 0.2 is a lot less than 5. Okay? So it is going to be a lot faster. All right. So now I've just plugged into that equation. Again, it comes from the previous page. I have all this information, right? Cam1 is the same as GM1, it's 1. I got the GP1. Well, it's boring, right? You plug it in this equation. It's, it's, not, it's not rocket science, all right? You end up with something that looks like this. Again, this is a PI controller. Um, what have I done here? I put it into this form here. Just done a few manipulations, not much. And you can see that if you compare this to the form of a PI controller, the con tau i for this controller is 10, and the KC for this controller is 1 half, okay? So P, there's a PI controller for the inner loop. There's a PI controller for the outer loop. Okay? And so the idea here is that all I've done is this direct census design. All I've done is apply the formulas on the previous page. But on the previous page, I just did direct census twice. All right. Let's see how this works. We already did see how this works. But anyway. Um, oh, okay. I did a little bit of a comparison here. Okay. All right. So there's our cascade control, right? When do we think this cascade controller is going to be useful? We think the cascade controller is going to be useful when this disturbance, a disturbance comes in this inner loop, okay? 
So what I wanted to do to show you the advantages of cascade controls, I wanted to, des to de design a controller that wasn't cascade, right? That had no inner loop. And I told you this last time, so if you want to get rid of the inner loop, set this transfer function to zero. That'll get rid of the feedback here, right? And set this transfer function to one. That'll get rid of the controller. And that way, this controller will send its signal directly to the valve. Okay, so that, that's a way to simplify anything you do for a cascade controller to a conventional controller, okay? So if you look, if you do that, if you set this equal to one and you set this equal to zero, and the process basically is, consists now of those three transfer functions in series, right? Because from the standpoint of the controller, you have this, this, and this in series, right? Because this has been set equal to one. So on the, the slide you'll see, I say to design this conventional controller, I'm going to consider the transfer function to be, well, I also included the GM1, sorry about that. Um, now I've got to go back here. I'm torturing you guys today, sorry. <laughs> All right. So set this equal to 1, set this equal to 0. And so what's the uh, fr essential uh, effective process transfer function this guy sees? That thing times that thing times that thing times that thing, you know, like the GOL. So I'm going to design a controller based on that being the process transfer function, okay? And if you take these things together, because you have a GP1 and a GV that are for both first order, you multiply them together, you get that. I just took those from the previous page and multiply them together. The key thing here is you have to see that you want to do the design based on this transfer function, okay? All right, so then I went to the table. You remember that IMC table? I think it's table 12.1. And I d determine these, I just pu pulled these formulas out of the table. So it's a, so right, you look in the table, it has something that looks like K over tau 1 S plus 1 plus tau 2 S plus 1. And you just use the formulas in the table. So it tells me to pick KC according to this formula. Okay, it tells me to pick tau I according to that formula. And tau, in this case, it says I should have derivative action in the controller. And I picked out tau D according to that formula. So you use these formulas with K equal 20, tau 1 equal 1, tau 2 equal 10, and a tau c equal 5. Why 5? Because 5 is 1 half the dominant time constant of 10 here. So that's why I chose 5. Okay? Plug all this stuff in, get that. All right? Okay. So um, I guess I wanted to show you this yet again, but we know that to implement these things, depending on which controller and simulink you pick, it doesn't want you to write the controller in the form we like. It likes you to write the controller as being like P plus I plus D. So all I've done here is translate my controller parameters that involve KC, tau I, and tau D into the P, I, and D that MATLAB likes. Okay, we've, done, we've actually done that before. All right, so what have I done? <laughs> Designed two controllers. One is a cascade controller using direct synthesis that I just explained to you. And then I want to compare this to a conventional controller that doesn't have that inner feedback loop. And to do this, I just use the IMC tuning rules to get the, okay? So now supposedly, um, there should be some advantage to doing the cascade control. Let's see. Okay. So this is how you put a cascade controller together in Simulink. There's, there should be nothing very um, shocking or earth shattering about this, right? So I could do it, but you really want to leave soon, right? So I won't, you, you, can, you trust me, I do this not hard, right? Blo throw in, a, drop in a couple transfer function blocks here. Um, that's the dynamics of the valve, right? You enter the numerator and denominator coefficients. That's the dynamics of the process. Um, you have a couple of disturbances you want to simulate to see the advantage of the cascade control. So I threw one that entered the inner loop and added to the output here, one that had the, um, that entered the outer loop. The reason I don't have any transfer functions here, because I told you they're both one, so they don't do anything, okay? I uh, have a measurement here, right? Sorry, measure the output I actually want to control, compare that to the set point. That becomes an error signal for the PID controller. That is the outer controller I designed, the GC1, I believe I called it. Um, and that provides, um, the set point for this inner control loop, right? So you have a measurement here you use, compare it to the set point, send it to the inner controller, that sends a signal to the valve and everything. So all I did was just construct this diagram, the transfer functions that I gave you on the previous page. That class is already getting out over there, by the way. They're all smiling and stuff. It's Friday, we're out of here. All right, 
not, not to rub it in or anything. But um, OK, so what did I do here? I think, as I recall, I did three tests. OK, what, what I should, well, OK, I did three tests. First test is I wanted to test if the Cascade controller does anything useful. OK, so what it should do is eliminate the effect of this disturbance much better than if I don't have Cascade control. That's the whole, that's not supposed to do anything else. OK. So I simulated this disturbance for cascade control, right? I just did a step change. It looks to me like I did a step change at time equal 5, probably of magnitude 1, with the step function here. And the set point remains constant at 0, right? Because I'm not doing a set point change. I'm doing a disturbance change. And you can see the, the, the perturbation here is really super small, right? It barely deviates from the set point. It goes back really quickly. It, it did what I said it would do, eliminated the effect of that disturbance really well. Okay. Um, now, I also compared the cascade controller, and the way I compare to implement the cascade controller, what did I do? Uh, you can't, you have to modify this block diagram. First thing you have to do is eliminate this feedback here, right, because that doesn't exist. Actually, I'm sure I created another f uh, MDL file that did this, I assume. So, the idea is if you had already built this thing here, you wouldn't want to start from scratch and build the conventional controller. So the first, I would rename this thing a different name. I would take this, <laughs> eliminate this connection, and because of that, I'd eliminate that too, right? And I take this thing out, and I just connect that PID controller directly to the valve. And that's it. That's how you take this diagram and convert it. And then for my PID controller, right? I would have to enter the parameters that I derive. So when I did this cascade control, I entered the parameters that I derive for the direct synthesis method in that one and that one. And so when I eliminate that and eliminate that, eliminate that feedback and send the signal directly here for conventional control, I need to enter the new parameters, right? Those parameters for the conventional controller instead of the two sets I have over here. All right. So if you do that, you simulate the same disturbance coming in this inner loop without this feedback. Um, you can see it's, it's a lot, lot worse, right? Very big perturbation, very slow to recover. I, I chose this example for a reason. I mean, OK. All right, so that's good. It does its job. And then the last thing is that if you do the other two possibilities, which is you either change the disturbance here entering the outer loop, or you change the set point, and we admitted it almost from the beginning that this shouldn't help at all for that. It only designed to help for this, so it shouldn't do much for these two. And you compare those two controllers I just described, Cascade, conventional, they give almost the same behavior, okay? So you do a disturbance in the outer loop at time equal 5, big perturbation, but the, the main point is they're the same. They don't, there's not much difference, very little. And same thing for a set point change, right? Do a set point change at time equal 5, they both bring it there, they look almost identical, all right? So the moral of the story here is that um, cascade, is, cascade control is going to work well if the problem is associated with the disturbance that enters this inner loop, otherwise not, okay? So a typical, well, I'll stop in like 30 seconds, typical um, problem I would give you on a homework or a test if I gave you a cascade control problem, which there is one on the homework I gave you. Did you already have to do that homework, by the way? <laughs> That's what happens when you get behind, sorry. Um, that uh, I would give you a problem like this and ask you, you know, to basically go through this design procedure. So, like anything else, you don't have to rederive these equations because that's not necessary, but typically to use the equations, you have to have some idea where they came from and why they make any sense, but, okay. All right, so that's it. So here's the, here's the deal. Um, we're not here next week, I'm sure. Are you have any classes next week? Probably there'll be no Test and some, what? Design. design. They have tests and design? Oh, just one test the whole semester? Man, that's a lot of pressure. I hope you guys do okay. Um.